everyone and welcome back to another lecture video. Today we're going to talk about neurophysiology and specifically on the topic of the motor function of the cortex and brainstem. And it's going to be quite a difficult lecture but what we have to do is just enjoy this lecture and learn as much as we can. So on this picture that is shown on the screen right now, as we can see here, this describes the motor system of the body. And as you can see, there are different parts of the brain that are related to the motor function of the body. And uh, the first one that we have discussed before is the spinal control or the motor control of the spinal cord. And as we can see here, as we are going to talk about the cortex and the brainstem and how they control the motor functions of the body. So in this diagram on our first look, it feels like it's already overwhelming for us. It's There are a lot of lines. There's a pink line, a blue dotted line, a green line, and um, a red um, line. So as we can see, we are going to try to understand all of this. So as, as uh, I want you to understand is yes, this pink solid line represents the motor command. So you can see where this motor command is coming from. So this is the cerebral cortex. There's a pink solid line with an arrow going to the spinal motor center. So it, meaning there is a direct uh, motor command from the cortex going to the spinal cord. There, and then there are other lines. This pink line going first to the brain stem centers and then from the brain stem centers going to the spinal cord, which also signifies another form of motor command. There's another pink solid line going first to the red nucleus and then from the red nucleus, uh, there's another solid line going to the spinal cord. And from the cere cerebral cortex, there's another pink solid line which signifies motor command, which goes to the basal ganglia. So we're going to understand how this motor command functions and how are we able to move our body, what controls it. So there's also a feedback mechanism represented by these green lines, which we're going to talk about on another lecture video. And there are command monitors. This blue dotted line means they would be checking on the motor function that is being done, if it's correct, if it's precise. So these are the pathways. And of course, if there is a monitoring command and if they detect that there is something wrong, then there will be a corrective command represented by this red, uh, red uh, uncontinuous line. So... This is the motor system of the body and this is what makes our body be able to move. How we can dance, how we can perform our voluntary movements, so how we can eat. So these are all the things that controls our body or our muscles when we move. Okay, so volunteer, voluntary motor movements, they originate from the cerebral cortical association area. So meaning they originate from the brain. We think about what we want to do. These are voluntary motor movements. Versus we have what we call your neuronal circuits for walking and various reflexes, which are contained within the spinal cord. If you remember from the previous topic that we had in the spinal cord, there are reflexes and neuronal circuits that are already present for walking and various reflexes, meaning we don't have to think about it. This does not come from the brain, but it's already a reflex. Uh, there's a monosynaptic pathway already at the level of the spinal cord. Okay, now what we're going to talk about today is about the voluntary motor control of our movements. So when we talk about the cerebral cortex, it initiates most voluntary movements by activation patterns of function that are stored in the lower brain areas. So we have to activate this function in the lower brain areas and we'll understand that in a while. The cortex also has a direct pathway to the anterior motor neurons of the spinal cord. If you remember, going back to the first picture, there is the this is the direct pathway that we are talking about. From the cortex, the neural transmission are directly going to the spinal motor cortex or centers, specifically in the anterior motor neurons, which are what um, activates the muscles to cause movement. All right. 
Now, the cere cerebral cortex, it is a control of goal-directed movement, meaning it's voluntary. You really want to do something. For example, if you want to get a glass of water, if you want to kiss someone, if you want to hug someone, o, di ba yung mga examples natin, medyo pang Valentine's na. So, these are goal-directed movement. You want really want to do something. So, it is initiated by cognitive processes, then by external stimuli. So, unlike that of um, the stretch reflex, that is initiated, that movement was initiated because, for example, there's a uh, painful stimuli. So, it's an external stimuli. Versus these movements, which are cognitive, initiated by cognitive processes, ibig sabihin, naiisip natin siya, Right? Like, yeah, if you want to kiss someone, di mo naman pwedeng sabihin na, ay, sorry, reflex lang yon, hindi ko sadya. So, it's really a movement that you think about. It's really something that you want to do. So, uh, next is the hierarchical, hierarchical organization versus theory of parallel distributed network of various motor areas of the cortex. So there are two the theories. So there's a hierarchical organization, meaning the higher parts of the brain will control the movement of the body. Or there is another theory called, called parallel distribu distributed network, meaning there are various motor areas of the cortex that gives um, or initiates the movement. So uh, various motor areas from a parallel distributed network making their own significant contribution of the descending pathways. So I think sinasabi natin, if it's hierarchical, meaning it comes from the highest part of the cortical function, while if it is a parallel distributed network, it's like there are a contribution from various motor areas which then cause the movement. Now, there are different cortical motor areas that we have to understand. First, we have what we call your primary motor cortex. So as we can see in this picture on this portion, this is the primary motor cortex. And this execute movements that is then transferred to the brainstem and spinal cord where lower motor neurons causes voluntary movement. So we have to understand when we say lower motor neurons, kaya nga siya lower, it's located lower, meaning it's already in the spinal cords. We have upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. So these lower motor neurons will cause the voluntary movement. And as we are trying to look at this primary motor cortex, there are areas wherein it says what is being controlled. For example, here, the mouth is controlled on this portion of the primary motor cortex. We have here the face, hand, arms, trunk, feet, and legs. So we'll try to understand why. There is only a specific part of the brain that controls this area. So this is the primary motor cortex. Another area is what we call your premotor area. So it is located on this portion. So on this pink colored portion. So the premotor area, what it does when we say pre it means before. So before movement. So this premotor area, it generates movement plan that is then transferred to the primary motor cortex for execution. So when I ask you what creates the plan, what part of the brain creates the movement plan, the answer would be the premotor area. And then after which it will transfer that to the primary motor cortex, which will then execute the movement. Okay, another area would be the supplementary motor cortex or this portion located here. So this supplementary motor cortex will function to rehearse complex motor sequences. So it rehearses complex motor se sequences. So in, in our brain, we already try to think about how we're going to do these complex motor sequences. And this is the responsibility of your supplementary motor cortex. And another portion of the cortical motor area would be the cingulate motor areas, which we're going to talk about more on the next slides. Now, having understood the, the parts or the areas of the cortex, we now uh, try to understand the functional organization of the primary motor cortex. So this is the first part of the cortex, right? Primary motor cortex. And how is it organized? So as I've mentioned earlier, if we try to, to look at the frontal plane through the precentral gyrus, so we have here the precentral gyrus, and it is um, divided into, or it is shown through or using the frontal plane here. 
So this is the frontal section of the primary motor area in the right cerebral hemisphere. So as we can see, as we mentioned, the location is the, in the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe. Now, more cortical area is devoted to those muscles involved in skilled, complex, or delicate movements. So if we try to think about how we perform our movements, what part of the body usually performs skilled, complex, or delicate movements? That's why it's very important to protect these parts of the body because this performs most of the function that are um, specific and detailed. So we try to look at the hand, the hands, right? So the hands has a very skilled um, and complex and delicate movements. It can do a lot of things, diba? Ano bang pwedeng gawin ng kamay natin? There are a lot of things that we can do with our hands. That's why our brain devotes more uh, area of the cortex to control the hand. That's why, as you can see here in this picture, it's very large. Aside from that, it's also, we have the face, specifically the mouth, that is really being shown here to have more cortical areas assigned. So for vocalization, salivation, mastication. So the jaw, tongue, and for swallowing. So more cortex or more cortical areas assigned. Even for the lips. The lips has also skilled, oh, diba? skilled function. Ano kayo skilled function niya? What else? Complex or delicate function, such as here, I'm talking. Okay, when we eat. Okay, and we, when we do other things with our lips. So here, we have the face, the eyelid, and the eyeball, the eyebrow, and the neck. So makikita natin dito, it is located on this portion of the um, frontal lobe. So, or the part of the cortical area. We also have here the thumb, the index, middle, right, a ring, and little finger. So, here, the hand. So, if you try to measure the cortical area that is assigned just for the hand, it's really very big. Kasi nga, we have to devote to those muscles with more skilled, complex, or delicate movements. For the wrist, elbow, shoulder, trunk, this is for the hip, knee, ankle, and toes. So this is the functional organization of the primary motor cortex. Now, when we talk about the primary cor cor motor cortex, the cortical region from which elicits movement with the least amount of electrical stimulation. So even if they give only a very few or small amount of electrical stimulation, they can elicit movement. They are, lo they are located in portions of the precentral gyrus, which we already said, and nakita na natin sa picture. And it is in Broadman's uh, area 4. So we'll talk about this in a while. The primary motor cortex is also known as the area pyramidalis, which contains Bet's pyramidal cells. So these are the types of cells located in the primary motor cortex. With uh, topographical representations of the different muscle areas of the body, uh, which is also known as the motor homunculus. So when we talk about topographical representations, this is what we're talking about. This is the homunculus, meaning there are specific areas of the cortex which controls specific body parts. So we have mentioned that already. So movement is evoked but by many non-contiguous columns throughout wide regions of the motor cortex. Now, it's uh, the motor cortex, primary motor cortex, is important for voluntary initiation of finely controlled movements of hands and fingers. So we have emphasized on that already. It exerts continual tonic stimul stimulatory effect on anterior motor neurons of the spinal cord, which maintains the muscle tone. So, for example, if we're trying to do something, nagiging continuous, it's the primary con cortex will continually give or provide stimulatory effect to the spinal cord, specifically in the anterior motor neuron, to maintain the muscle tone of that specific muscle being used. So again, um, this is the primary motor cortex, which we just discussed. I hope you remember the homunculus, which is the to topographical representation of uh, what the cortex or what part of the body is being controlled by the cortex. Now, let's move on to the supplemental and premotor areas. So when we talk about supplementary motor area, 
this portion, it causes bilateral contractions. That's why when we try to look at the location, it is also located bilaterally. So it provides background for the finer motor control of the arms, mm -hmm. hence by the primary motor cortex and premotor area by providing body-wide attitudinal and fixation movements. Remember what we mentioned earlier, it is for rehearsing this complex movement. Now, the supplementary motor area, uh, if it is stimulated, it can also cause movement of single joints, but it requires higher intensity and longer duration stimulation versus the primary motor cortex. Um, we have also to remember if we there is a stimulation, it will result either in complex postural movements and vocalization, or it can also cause an arrest in speech and movement. So this is what is being done. When, well, um, if there is the destruction of the supplemental motor area, uh, the result would be lack of bilateral movement or loss of movement of opposite extremities. So we have to remember that. Now, the cingulate motor areas, this is what we were talking about earlier. When we talk about cingulate motor areas, it is divided into a dorsal, which is posterior, ventral, anterior, and rostral cingulate motor areas. So it also contributes to the cortical or the corticospinal tract and has its own somatotopic map. When we talk about uh, somatotopic, this term means that when a specific part of the body, uh, that a specific part of the body is associated with a distinct location in the uh, in the cortical or in the central nervous system rather somatotopic so there's a specific part of the body that is associated with the specific part of the brain so this cingulate motor areas will contribute to the corticospinal tract now it requires high intensity stimulation to evoke movement so just like the supplementary motor area and it is related to preparation and execution of movements so if we try to understand this this um, cortex function, or cortex motor function is very, very intricate or uh, it's very complicated, but it is really needed for us to be able to move properly. Now, there are specialized areas of the motor cortex. We have what we call the Broca's area. So this area, uh, when damaged, will cause decreased speech capability. So Broca's area, we have a mnemonic here, which is BMWs. So meaning the Broca's area is for motor control. Okay, motor control. While the Wernicke's area is for um, sensory control of speech. Okay, so when the Broca's area is damaged, it will cause decreased speech capability. It is closely associated uh, with uh, area controls appropriate for respiratory function for speech. Now, another area that is a specialized area of the motor cortex is eye fixation and head rotation area. So this is uh, specific for coordinated head and eye movements. And of course, the hand skills area, when this is damaged, it will cause motor apraxia or the inability to perform fine hand movements. So apraxia inability to perform fine hand movements. Now, how are these signals being transmitted uh, from the cortex? So how do we have the transmission of these cortical motor signals? There are two pathways. We have a direct pathway and an indirect pathway. When we talk about direct pathway, this will involve the corticospinal tract, and this is for discrete and detailed movement. We'll talk more about that. Indirect pathway, on the other hand, will send first signals to the basal ganglia. If you remember, the pink line going to the basal ganglia. There is also indirect pathway going to the cerebellum and to the brainstem nuclei. So, these motor centers and pathways are divided into two. We have a pyramidal tract and an extra pyramidal tract. Both of these pathways are essential for voluntary movements and... Um, here we can see from for the pyramidal tract we have the corticospinal and cortical 
ball ball tra tracks that passes through the medullary pyramids. So why do we call it? I want you to understand this class. Why do we call it pyramidal track? Because these pathways passes through the medullary pyramids. Pyramidal track. Well, when you say extra pyramidal track, extra because they do not pass through the pyramidal um, or through the medullary, medullary pyramids. That's why we call them extra. They are outside. So these motor pathways originate in the brainstem structures. Okay? It originates in the brainstem structures, but they do not pass through the pyramids. So we have only the corticospinal and cortical bulbar tracts that passes through the medullary pyramids. So we have here, as uh, we're going back, we have here the direct pathway, the corticospinal tract. Why do we term it corticospinal tract and how are you going to learn about those words? So first class, you have to check what was the first word mentioned. Cortex, right? Corticospinal. From the cortex, where will the nerve or the motor signals be transmitted? It goes to the spine. Kaya siya cortico spinal tract from the cortex to the spine so it's a direct pathway another pathway would be the cortico bulbar tract which we're going to talk about later so here there is an indirect pathway from the cerebral cortex it goes to the basal ganglia and there's no direct pathway going to the spinal cord that's why we call it indirect pathway there are also signals um, from the are going to the other parts of the body which are considered to be indirect pathway. So first, we're going to talk about the direct pathway. We call this the descending motor pathway. So why descending? Because it comes from the brain. We said earlier that voluntary movements do not have an external stimuli. Rather, it is initiated by the brain. That's why it will be considered descending. So we have a lateral system, a medial system, and a monoaminergic pathway. Let's talk about first about the lateral system. So we have the lateral corticospinal, lateral corticobulbar tract. This, both of these tracts determinate in the limb muscle, motor neurons, and lateral interneurons of the spinal cord gray matter. Uh, just think about it this way. It always terminates in the spine because that is where the corticospinal tract is heading. So this is a picture showing us the lateral corticospinal tract. We have here the motor cortex class, left and right motor cortex. And from the motor cortex, it will pass through the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Then we have here the uh, genu of the corpus callosum, so both right and left hemisphere. It will pass through the basis pedunculi of mesencephalon to the longitudinal fascicles of the pons. These are parts of the brainstem already. And to the pyramidal Pyramid of Medulla Oblongata. That's why it's called a pyramidal tract, right? So uh, there will be decusation. It will cross over class. So look at look at this portion. There is a decusation from uh, the left going to the right lateral corticospinal tract, uh, as well as for the left corticospinal tract going to the right lateral corticospinal tract. So after the pyramids, that is where the decusation of fibers occur. Aside from that, some of the fibers will go to the ventral corticospinal tract. So let's talk about the lateral corticospinal tract. It originates from the primary motor, premotor, supplemental, and cingulate motor areas of the frontal lobe and the somatosensory cortex of the parietal cortex. So we have discussed that from this portion. And the cells are the pyramidal cells of layer 5 or the giant Betz cells. So that's what we call the cells located in the lateral corticospinal tract. So as we have mentioned, the cortical, uh, just to give um, a detailed um, discussion on the corticospinal fibers, we have 34,000 Betz cell fibers. Uh, it make up only about 3% of the total number of fibers. Now, 97% of the 1 million fibers are small diameter fibers, which functions to conduct background tonic signals. It feeds back signals from the cortex to control intensity of the various sensory signals to the brain. So these are what makes our corticospinal fibers. The BETS cell fibers only comprise 
a very small amount of these fibers, only 3%. Majority of the fibers are small diameter fibers. So it controls the feedback signals from the cortex to the uh, to control the intensity of the signals from the brain. As we have mentioned earlier, we have only we only need a very small amount of motor signal from the cortex to initiate movement. Now, the termination of the cortical spinal tract, along with the fibers of the rubro spinal tract, they terminate mainly in the interneurons of the intermediate area of the cord gray matter. As I've mentioned earlier, spinal, this is the end portion. Dito siya gustong pumunta. But uh, specifically, it could be in the interneuron or directly into the anterior motor neuron. So some terminate directly into the anterior motor neuron in the cervical enlargement of the spinal cord to control discrete movements of the hands and fingers. So I want you to remember this. Um, some will already directly terminate in the anterior motor neuron. If you remember our lecture on the spinal cord, there is uh, an interneuron and an anterior motor neuron. So some will already directly um, terminate or end in the cervical enlargement, specifically at the anterior motor neuron. So these are specific for control of the movements of the hands and fingers. So I just want to show you here um, where this is the spinal, spinal cord. There is, we have the inter, an anterior motor neuron and we have here for the lateral corticospinal tract, this is where they terminate. So corticospinal tract from pyramidal cells of the cortex. So we have here, um, next, the corticobulbar tract. Okay, so corticobulbar, meaning the signals are still from the cortex. Okay, corticobulbar tract, it does not end in the spinal cord. So these arise from the lateral aspect of the primary cortex, and they receive the same inputs as the corticospinal tract. But as we can see here, it does not go to the spinal cord. Rather, the fibers converge and pass through the internal capsule of the brainstem. So they converge and pass through the internal capsule of the brainstem. Neurons terminate on the motor nuclei of the cranial nerves. So that's why it's called corticobulbar. When we say bulbar, they do not end on the spinal cord. Rather, it ends on the motor nuclear of, nuclei of the cranial nerves. Um, then they synapse with the lower motor neurons, which carry signals to muscles of the face and neck. So the corticobulbar tract controls the movements of the face and neck. They are involved in the control of facial and jaw muscles, swallowing and tongue movements. Now, we have the rubrospinal tract. Rubro, this means red, uh, going to the spine, rubrospinal tract. They originate from the magnocellular portion of the red nucleus in the midbrain. So the rub rubro pertains to the red nucleus located in the midbrain. So in the spinal cord, they lie ventral to the lateral corticospinal tract. So meaning they lie anterior. So as we can see here, this is the corticospinal tract lateral. The rubrospinal tract will terminate on this portion. It is ventral to that of the corticospinal tract. So it affects motor neurons controlling distal muscles. And it is an accessory route for transmission of this decrease, discrete signals from the cortex to the spinal cord. So it's not directly to the spinal cord. It goes first from the cortex to the red nucleus and from the red nucleus to the spinal cord. It is an area of integration of activities of motor cortex and cerebellum. So if we try to look at the picture, so just to explain to you class, from the cerebral cortex, signals, motor signals will be transmitted to the red nucleus in the midbrain. And from the red nucleus, going to the spinal cord, this is the pathway which we call rubrospinal tract. It already starts from the red nucleus going to the spine. But as we can see here, there are motor signals from the cortex to the red nucleus. All right? So... That is for our rubrospinal tract. Another picture would be here. From the motor cortex, there are signals going to the red nucleus. So we have here the rubro 
spinal tract going to the spinal cord. Now, another picture that I want to, I, another thing that I want you to see, we have the motor cortex. It has signals and then it will stop only at the motor nuclei of the different cranial nerves. So that is the cortico, I'm sorry, uh, the, this is rather the cortico rubral tract that is being shown. From the motor cortex going to the red nucleus, we call that cortico rubral because it's from the cortex to the red nucleus, cortico rubral. But from the red nucleus to the spinal cord, we call that rubro spinal tract. Okay. Now, we have uh, discussed the lateral system. Let's move on to the medial system. So the medial system class are made up of the medial corticospinal tract and most of the corticobulbar tract. These terminate in the medial group of interneurons of the spinal cord and equivalent neurons in the brainstem. So remember, the corticospinal tract has a lateral portion, but some fibers of the corticospinal tract will go to the ventral area. So this is what we call then the medial corticospinal tract. Now the function is the control of axial muscles, so the um, that of the trunk, and bilateral, bilateral contractions for bilateral functions and for postural support. So the ventral corticospinal tract is important for the postural support that we have. Now, let's move on to our extrapyramidal tracts. When we talk about this extrapyramidal tracts class, we see here on this picture, this is, in this figure, we can see the um, medullary reticulospinal tract. We have the lateral vestibulospinal tract and the pontine reticulospinal tract. So just listening from the terms class, we know that the pontine reticular spinal tract will start from the pontine reticular nuclei and end in the, in the spine. We also have a vestibulospinal tract. So from the vestibular nuclei, the motor signals will terminate at the level of the spinal cord. And a medullary reticular spinal tract from the medullary reticular nuclei, it will end in the spinal cord. Now, here is a summarized table of the extrapyramidal tracts class. And we can see here the rubrospinal tract, the distribution, and the actions. So from the red nucleus, it will terminate in the interneurons of the lateral spinal cord. So the action would be it will stimulate flexors and inhibit extensors. So this is a summary table. I want you to uh, learn about this. The pontine reticulospinal tract from the pons to the ventromedial spinal cord, meaning anterior but and medial portion, it will stimulate both flexors and extensors, but mainly extensors. For our med medullary reticulospinal tract, we have medullary reticular formation to the spinal cord interneurons in the intermediate gray area, and it will inhibit both flexors and extensors, but mainly extensors. We also have the lateral uh, vestibulospinal tract from the dieter's nucleus to the ipsilateral motor neurons and interneurons. And the action would be to inhibit flexors and stimulate extensors. And the tectospinal tract from the superior colliculus to the cervical spinal cord, we have this is for the control of neck muscles. So it's very important also to learn about this tectospinal tract. Now, class. These are the extrapyramidal tracts. I know uh, there are a lot. Uh, this is a lot to accommodate. And um, sabi nga namin, when we were uh, studying in med school, we have to to forget our childhood memories in order for us to have new space for memory for our brain. Diba? Nakakatawa lang. Kalimutan na muna natin yung mga memories natin, yung childhood natin. Para naman... Magkaroon tayo ng space for the memory to uh, save yung terms na tectospinal tract, rubrospinal tract. But you know, uh, really, um, it's this is a little uh, difficult to learn. But if you try to understand the root words, when you say rubrospinal, you will already know where it and uh, starts and when uh, where we, will it terminate. So that's how you should understand these pathways. So again, we have here the motor system. I hope this is um, better 
understood by you now, so from the cerebral cortex to the corticospinal tract, it will terminate in the interneurons or in the anterior motor neurons of the spinal cord. And then this will stimulate the muscles to um, produce an action. And then uh, there will be a feedback mechanism. So the receptors in the muscle upon the movement of the muscle will provide sensory signal to the spinal relay nuclei and then to the spinal cerebellum and to the different parts of the body, which will then correct a movement. And then going back to the cortex and then another um, transmission of motor signals will occur. So just a brief review of the incoming sensory pathways to the motor cortex. Um, when we talk about this, subcortical fibers from adjacent areas of the cortex, especially from somatic sensory areas of the parietal cortex and visual and auditory cortex. So we have here um, subcortical fibers as well from opposite hemisphere, which passes through the corpus callosum, will provide incoming, incoming sensory signals to the motor cortex, as well as somatic sensory fibers from the ventrobasal complex of the thalamus. So, um, dami niyang sinasabi, but what it only wants to say is that in the motor cortex, it will receive sensory sensory signals from different areas um, in the adjacent areas of the cortex, in the opposite hemisphere, and from the thalamus. So from the thalamus, it will receive cutaneous and proprioceptive fibers. There are also ventrolateral and ventroanterior nuclei of the thalamus for coordination function between the motor cortex, basal ganglia, and cerebellum. And fibers from the intralaminar nuclei of the thalamus, which will control the level of excitability of the motor cortex, and some of these uh, may be pain fibers. Okay. So sensory feedback, uh, which are important for motor control. So there are feedback from muscle spindles. So this will uh, feedback the length of the muscle, which we discussed before. We also have tactile receptors and proprioceptors fine-tunes these muscle movements. Length mismatch in spindle causes autocorrection. That's why we need really the muscle spindles and Golgi tendon for feedback. Compression of skin provides sensory feedback to motor cortex on the degree of effectiveness of intended action. So it's very, very nice to look at our brain class. It's like um, a, a lot of people are working in order for us to uh, do what we need to do or to perform the movement precisely and correctly. So the excitation of spinal motor neurons. So we have, a, we have the layer 5 of the cortex. Excitation of 50 to 100 giant pyramidal cells is needed to cause muscle contraction. And most cortical spinal fibers synapse with interneurons. But remember what we said earlier, some will synapse with anterior motor neurons at the portion of the cervical enlargement, which will control what? The hands and fingers, movement of the hands and fingers. So some cortical, cortical spinal and rubrospinal neurons synapse directly with alpha motor neurons, which I just said, in the spinal cord, especially in the cervical enlargement. And these motor neurons innervate muscles of the fingers and hand. Paulit-ulit. Okay, but that is for emphasis class. Now, we have the final common pathway. When we talk about the final common pathway, this means that the motor neuron by which nerve impulses from the from many central sources passes to a muscle or gland in the periphery, meaning narating niya na yung gusto niyang marating. Diba? Kagaya niyo, nag-aaral kayo for med. You, you're learning for med school. There is a pathway that you want to achieve. You want to become a licensed medical doctor, right? I promise you that this job is worthy of being your life's work. For years, you've worked insanely hard. You've sacrificed your social lives, relationships, and pulled who knows how many all-nighters. I am in awe of, um, of what you've done. But every day, you'll be actively and specifically making this world a better place. Medicine is magic for adults, and it is. It is magic that's made possible. Now, for the motor function of the cortex, the final common pathway means that the motor neurons or these nerve impulses has already reached the muscles that they want to activate. 
or cause movement. So that is what we call the final common pathway. So this is the part of the spinal cord which will show us then what uh, specific areas of the spinal cord do these uh, tracks terminate. So the corticospinal tract terminates on this lateral portion. We have the rubrospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, and this shows us the final common pathway of the different tracts, whether they are pyramidal or extrapyramidal tracts. Now, to end this lecture, we're going to discuss the other possible lesions of the motor cortex and their possible effect. What if there is a lesion in the primary motor cortex? This will cause loss of voluntary control of discrete movement of the distal segments of the limbs. So you will no longer be able to control precisely these movements that are voluntary. Um, basal ganglia, on the other hand, if there is a lesion, there will be muscle spasticity from loss of inhibitory input from the accessory areas of the cortex that inhibit excitatory brainstem motor nuclei. We'll learn more about the motor function of the basal ganglia in the next lecture. So it will cause spasticity, meaning there will still be movement, but it will not be fine-tuned or it will not be... Um, very, very uh, detailed, okay, spastic siya in nature. Now, when we talk about uh, the brainstem function of motor control, there are specific areas that the brainstem could control um, in terms of motor function. So special control functions would include control of respiration, okay? That's why if there is a lesion or trauma in the brainstem, it will cause death because this portion controls our breathing. Others would include control of cardiovascular system. There is also partial control of the gastrointestinal function, uh, stereotype movements of the body, control of equilibrium and eye movements are also uh, being uh, one, por one portion of the con function control of the brainstem. Another thing is the support of the body against the gra against gravity, which then involves the reticular nuclei. So support of the body against gravity, we have the pontine reticular nuclei, which transmits ex excitatory signal from the vestibular nuclei and from the nuclei of the cerebellum. The medullary reticular nuclei will transmit then inhibitory signals to the same neurons as the pontine nuclei, and the vestibular nuclei will transmit strong excitatory signals to control anti-gravity muscles. So this picture here shows us um, the reticular formation. So there are uh, signals from the different parts of the areas that I have mentioned earlier, the pontine reticular nuclei, medullary reticular nuclei, and the vestibular nuclei. So that ends our lecture for the motor function of the cortex and the brainstem. It's a little bit of uh, overwhelm. It's a little bit overwhelming to to try to understand all those terms, but you just have to listen to it or read it over and over, and then that would be easier for you to remember already. Don't forget your childhood memories class. I was just kidding. You just really have to have more focus when you're trying to study and. You know, you just have to remember your final common pathway as a medical student, and that is to get your license and to become great doctors someday. So that ends our lecture, and see you on the next lecture video.